everyone. Uh, this mic is not working, so I'm just going to project. Can everyone hear me right now? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that I want to start off this talk by talking about the first time that I attended first lectures, and that was the year it began. And I remember I was a sophomore. I had, I think, just declared my major in psychology and taken my first photography course the fall semester before that. And it was really interesting to, to think back to that time period because I never would have predicted the events that have happened afterwards. And so I never would have predicted that I would find research that I enjoy doing and that I define myself as a part of. I never would have predicted that uh, I'd be studying photography academically. And I most definitely would not have predicted that I would be giving this talk today. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that when I had attended the event, I was really glad that there was an opportunity to learn from other students' experiences. And I thought that that was a rare and meaningful opportunity. And so with this presentation, I hope that uh, you're able to pick up on whatever aspects resonate with you, not that this is an entirely uh, regimented, prescribed um, thing that I'm about to tell you, but that uh, whichever parts of the talk do, do click with you, I hope that you're able to carry forth with them and make them your own story. So uh, before I, can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, before I talk about my undergraduate experience at Carnegie Mellon, I'd like to lead up to that with um, a little bit of background information of who I am so that you have my story in better context. So I am an American-born Indian, a first generation. And uh, in order for, for me to describe what that means, I'm going to have to give a little synopsis of my family. And so uh, my father, uh, interestingly enough, came from very humble roots in India. Uh, it's safe to say that he lived in impoverished conditions. And he's told me a lot about how his father, that is my grandfather, had made one decision that had changed the course of his life. And that one decision was that he wanted his son, my father, to get an education as a child, as opposed to work for the family and help put food on the table. And so, Hearing something like that from my own father, I think, has really kind of instilled in me um, gratitude for the opportunity of education. And uh, that's, that's been something that I try to remind myself of consistently, that uh, there's people who don't have this opportunity that we have to be here at Carnegie Mellon University and take whichever classes that we please and grow from that. And uh, in a similar manner, my mother had, uh, in, for her bachelor's degree, she studied um, English. And I remember my grandmother was recently just telling me a couple weeks ago about how English was, um, was kind of this elite thing to study in India at that time. And, uh, and soon after, they had both uh, married and immigrated to the United States, where uh, I've been born and raised in Michigan my entire life. And uh, it's interesting because when I asked my father, why did you move to the U US? Why did you choose to leave your home country and, and transfer boundaries? And he was telling me about how the United States is where he felt that he could have better opportunities at that time, at least. And so here we are with education and better opportunities. And uh, I remember that uh, there, there's a couple distinct moments I think that everyone can think back to and say that that, that was a defining experience. And for me, in my K-12 education, there was one particular instance um, that I would like to describe to you. So I had, I had an elementary school teacher for third grade, fourth grade, and for sixth grade. Uh, it just so happened that she had moved up with me by coincidence. And so you can imagine being, being a child in elementary school and having the same teacher for three years, right? Uh, she, she was an amazing person, Mrs. Medea. And I remember that in Mrs. Medea's class, we would sit down for story time, and sometimes she would read a storybook, and sometimes she would tell us about brain research. And, uh, and I, I really just remember her holding, holding like a newspaper type journal and just telling us about it. And specifically in her classroom, she had a giant poster titled Multiple Intelligences. 
And some people might know what multiple intelligences is, but I'm going to provide um, a summary of it. So multiple intelligences is the theory of intelligence. So intelligence in, in one way can, can be theorized as something that's standardized and linear. So you can imagine how an IQ assessment is something that proposes all people can take the same test and be ranked against each other in, um, in a uniform manner, saying that one person is more intelligent than another, for example. And instead, multiple intelligences proposes that there's nine different ways of being smart. And as I describe to you these nine different intelligences, I want you to try to think about which ones resonate with you, which is something that I had done growing up. Imagine that there are these nine different types of intelligences that form a pie chart. And this theory suggests that each person has their own compilation of, their, of the nine intelligences into a pie chart. So you can imagine that uh, we're each beautiful little snowflakes who, uh, who are uniquely intelligent and equally intelligent in our own ways. And so one form of intelligence is bodily awareness and kinesthetics. So you can imagine how a dancer or a surgeon has such minute control over each of their muscles. You can imagine another form of intelligence is uh, existential intelligence, this, um, this craving and desire to contemplate life's biggest questions. Uh, what is the meaning of life? What are we doing here? Things like that. Two other categories include interpersonal intelligence and intrapersonal. Intrapersonal intelligence is the ability to reflect within oneself and uh, to, to contemplate with oneself. Maybe it's, how am I feeling today? Or what am I doing that I actually like? Another form of intelligence is interpersonal skills, which is the ability to form social connections with one another, to, uh, to be able to empathize with people, to feel compassionate. Uh, you can imagine how a good politician should have that, uh, similar to how, um, <laughs> how our RAs and OCs thrive in interpersonal intelligence. And uh, another form of intelligence is uh, naturalistic intelligence, and that's the ability to kind of resonate with nature. You can imagine like homeopathic medicine is very along that alley. Uh, another form is spatial awareness. So this 3D map that some people have that I most definitely do not have. Uh, so, so someone like an early explorer or sailor or even a taxi driver today is able to, to have an idea of where they are in space. Another form of intelligence is analytical and uh, mathematical reasoning, the ability to pick up on patterns, to, uh, to think along quantitative lines. And uh, another form of intelligence is linguistic intelligence, the ability to use words and diction really precisely. A poet and a writer will definitely have those skills. And so you can imagine, as a child, I had been raised with this, with this idea, right? This idea of thinking of myself in a dynamic way and also thinking about others in a dynamic way. And so as that happened, I was constantly trying to figure out what it is that my uh, innate multiple intelligences lie in. And that's something that has carried through with me until now and it's still happening. So, so I'm going to share with you some examples of how I was able to detect that for myself and uh, how I've been able to apply uh, some of my, my intelligences, I think, during my Carnegie Mellon experience, which has definitely made the experience so enjoyable and uh, rewarding along the way. So I, I have always had an interest in interpersonal, intrapersonal skills, in, um, in learning about myself and about others, and I think that that's shown through my psychology interests. So I'm a psychology major. I also learned that photography was another way that I could engage with, with a similar capacity where uh, I can work with other individuals, take portraits, try to learn about them, try to learn about their stories. And um, it's been really interesting because both of those interests have been able to be fused during my uh, research experience. So I was able to travel to India to do a documentary photography project and learn more about my roots. And so I have a series of, of images that I'll just walk you through. And as you look at these, you can try to pick up on how, how this ability to connect with other people and other cultures can be shown.
And another way that I've been able to engage with this similar idea of interacting with people and serving people has been through my work as an academic coach on campus. And so I started off uh, really liking the idea of helping peers, helping peers in areas like time and stress management, to sit down with them weekly and try to uh, be a mentor of whatever capacity that I could be for them. And it's been really interesting going through that process. And I think that when we do certain, certain activities that really resonate with us, it's amazing how we can feel at home doing that. And I'm going to share with you uh, one specific story with the permission of the person I'm going to anonymously be talking about, but um, to show how sometimes following our gut instincts about what it is that we might be good at or how, how we should navigate different choices um, can be rewarding. So I worked with a student for over a year now through weekly, weekly appointments. And uh, when I first started working with her, she was a freshman in her first semester really struggling. Uh, she was in CIT and I just remember we would sit down and make schedules and plans of how she should proceed her weekly assignments but then would just come back really frustrated and I would feel so bad because sometimes after appointments she'd sit in the other room in academic development and sit down and do her homework for a few hours and I could see that she was visibly trying. So then I was just prompted to ask her um, why is it that you're studying CIT? What do, you, what do you hope to do with this education? And she told me about how she had a summer camp that she went to where uh, her counselor had recommended that she, she try this out because at that time she really enjoyed uh, game design and robotics. Okay, so I asked her, what do you want to do with game design and robotics? And she said that she wants to help uh, with technology and education and the combination of the two. And so she was pursuing ECE as one way of getting to that. And it was really interesting because I just remember thinking, well, I bet there's other ways that she can she could reach her goal. And I didn't want to step over any boundaries, but I did want her to make an informed decision about what she was doing. So I helped set up uh, different meetings for her with, um, with the IDA program, with Dietrich advisors, HCI. And eventually, she, um, so current update, she is, a psychology major pursuing a minor in uh, game design and working in an HCI lab. And last semester she told me about how she got her first A and she was just so happy. And so that's one small example I think of how when, when we do certain things that really resonate with us, we're able to combine them. And I think that that's when, when our passions can come to fruition. And another example of how this has been happening for me is through my senior honors thesis, where uh, I've been able to combine my interests in uh, photography from this photography project and also uh, analyze my pictures through uh, psychology concepts. So how people will uh, project their own prejudices onto images, just like how we do in daily life situations, things like that. So it's really interesting uh, thinking about my CMU experience and how the culmination of what I have detected to be some of my passions is what has been able to make my CMU experience that much more exciting. And uh, it's, it's also kind of fascinating to think about how this is going to continue after graduation. So uh, one, one other activity that I've been involved in on campus has again been through academic coaching. So I, I detected that I enjoyed uh, working with people and I wanted to uh, be able to contribute skills to the program and so it's been really interesting uh, having having tried doing that in a more formal way and so you can imagine I've told you a specific instance where I was able to apply some of my own intuition that I gained from psychology into my experiences working with students and I wanted to make a lasting impression on, on the academic coaching department and so this semester I'm actually contributing psychology content to the training course that all academic coaches will be uh, going through, that they are going through right now, actually. It's supposed to be there. But, um, but uh, basically teaching certain psychology concepts as a part of the cultural sensitivity and um, this appreciation for things like multiple intelligences when we work with other students. I share with you examples of my Carnegie Mellon experience and uh, the merging of my different uh, 
multiple intelligences because I hope that it sets an example for how you could also engage in a similar reflection process. So I would like to summarize, summarize this talk and, and um, hopefully that these are kernels that you can take away with you and, um, and, and really reflect on. So the first one being uh, education is a gift. Right, so along uh, in this institution, we feel we feel sometimes stressed. We feel pressure sometimes. Sometimes we compare ourselves to others, and those are all very, very um, real experiences. But I think that if if we're able to remind ourselves that being here at this institution is such a rare opportunity, I'm not sure if you all remember, but I sure remember during my orientation when. Uh, the announcer, we were sitting under the big white tent and the announcer was reading off a number of valedictorians, perfect SAT and ACT scores that CMU rejected that year, right? And so that just shows you, each of us have made that cutoff, whatever that cutoff is, and the decision for us to be here at this moment is very, very intentional. And uh, another takeaway is I hope that each of us can reflect on what our own multiple intelligences and passions lie in. And I think that that's an evolving process, that it's something that we, we tap into day in and day out. But um, in doing so, I hope that we can also cultivate them into a meaningful life mission. And that is also, again, an evolving process, but I think is uh, really worthwhile. And so as I, as I describe these takeaways, I also want to put little caveats out there. Uh, the first one being, so you can imagine on a poster board, the little asterisks. So one asterisk being, ask for help along the way, right? We're surrounded by an abundance of resources uh, and inspiration around the corner. If there, is, if there is a professor whose research you admire, maybe it's worth just sending them an email and asking if you can talk, if you can talk with them. Or if you're struggling in a class and you, you, think, you think it's worth asking for help, maybe go to academic development and use any and all of their free resources. And um, another caveat that I'd like to put out there is uh, that you get out of this process what you put in. And so this is a very self-directed way, I think, of going about uh, the undergraduate experience and of uh, going after life, I think, because um, it seems like it seems like now that I'm graduating, right, that's becoming very real to me. Two months is all I have left in this in this environment here uh, as an undergraduate student. And so I think that the four years fly by as each day on its own can seem like it has um, like it's going to be never ending or like the tasks that we have to do are really really overwhelming and at times they definitely are but I hope that um, we can each instill a, a broader picture of what it is that we're doing here that we specifically have this opportunity to tap into ourselves and to detect what it is that we so desire to do, whatever that is, and then go after it, right? Um, I'm gonna share with you a specific anecdote of my experience in India on this documentary photography project that I hope can uh, portray what a unique opportunity we each have. So as a part of my experiences abroad, I really wanted to interview people in a dynamic way. Not just ask them bullet pointed questions, but really have a conversation with them. And sometimes this lasted for a couple hours. And with one specific instance, I went to a tailoring course that was offered by a nonprofit. And the goal of this tailoring course was to teach women skills that they could use to, be, to earn money for their family and gain a sense of independence. And in, doing, in, in visiting this, this course, I just remember uh, one interview turned into a group interview, and I was able to ask 20 women whichever questions I desired, and they were responsive. And uh, one question that I asked um, was, what is the biggest struggle that you feel you encounter in your daily life? And unlike any other question that I had asked that, that evening, all women responded in unison with the same answer. They said money. And then they all started talking about their own stories. And I just remember 
feeling like, okay, money is a struggle, but I wasn't even able to grasp the extent of it. So I asked them, can we maybe just say one story at a time? And so one woman had spoken up that her daughter, she had a six-year-old daughter at the time, who asked her mom if she could learn music. She wanted to learn vocal music lessons, and, and imagine a six-year-old daughter asking her mom that. And so then this mother proceeded to tell me that uh, she was able to send her daughter to lessons for two months, but then had to stop because the third month she simply didn't have enough money to, to pay for these classes. And I just remember thinking at that moment, so you can imagine, I grew up with this theory of multiple intelligences, went to India, and then heard a story like that. So here's this little girl. Maybe she's discovered what it is that she wants to, that she wants to pursue or dig a little deeper in. And um, not having the financial resources or just the opportunities to go about that. And, and I remember coming back from that trip a little bit devastated. I was talking with my parents about how, how it is that that can happen. And I remember my father, he told me in, in, one, in, in a one sentence answer that that's reality. That, um, that that's reality for a majority of the world. So, so when, I, when I take that instance, internalize it, and put it into context of what we're doing here, uh, we not only have the opportunity for an education, but we have the opportunity to be able to, to make a living of something that we're passionate about. And that is so rare. For some, for some people, getting an education might only be so that way they can earn whatever they need to survive. But we're at Carnegie Mellon University. We're here because we have passions. We're here because the admissions committee had detected that in us and detected that we had the perseverance and strength to go after them and to go after them perhaps in a way that we can give back to the greater world. And I, I sincerely hope that uh, we can all try our best in that meaningful um, reflection and life mission. I know that for me, although it's been challenging, sometimes it's like, what am I doing studying photography academically? <laughs> like, who does that? I don't know. Um, but following that, that intuition because we have the chance to. And, um, and trusting the system that we're in, that, uh, that we, we're here because we were meant to, and that uh, we're here also because we have the resources to go after our dreams. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>